everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, this webinar, uh, Recipes to Remember. I'm uh, the Interim Director uh, of the uh, Davis Humanities Institute, uh, Archana Venkatesan. I hold a dual appointment in the Department of Religious Studies and Comparative Literature. Uh, I'm really thrilled uh, that uh, this webinar is giving us an opportunity to partner with the UC Davis uh, Library and to showcase uh, the really remarkable uh, special collections uh, that our library uh, holds. Uh, one of the uh, one of the ma major goals of the uh, DHI is to uh, forge these partnerships across campus and to help uh, nurture uh, the research of our faculty and our graduate students in the arts humanities humanities and the humanistic social sciences. Uh, the, uh, each year, the Davis Humanities Institute uh, develops a public humanities theme, and this year we've chosen the theme of cultivation because it really speaks to the uh, strengths of our university, both in the uh, you know, world-famous agricultural school, but also in the, nerd, in the nascent discipline of food studies uh, that is really interdisciplinary. Um, and uh, we've got so many faculty in, across the campus who are working in various uh, aspects of, of food studies. So we thought this is an ideal theme that will forge connections across campus and foster interesting uh, conversations and showcase the research that is being undertaken on the theme of cultivation. So this uh, webinar, Recipes to Remember, will feature the uh, work of two graduate students, Ben Fong and Pia Yun Pua, both of whom are PhD the candidates in the department, uh, department of Comparative Literature. And uh, they will be in conversation with Aubrey Rusick, who is the, spe uh, the uh, special collection librarian for uh, food and wine at the Davis. Uh, this is the first of a series uh, on, this, uh, on this topic uh, uh, on recipes to remember, focusing on the very large uh, Chinese cookbooks collection in our library. This webinar uh, kicks off a series of podcasts as well as a culminating exhibition of the cookbooks that will be taking place at uh, the Shields Library in spring quarter 2023. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to, and a delight to be able to support the work of our remarkable graduate students and uh, Ben Fong and Tim Yu. Well, welcome to uh, the webinar, and Audrey as well, welcome, and I will now pass the baton over to, uh, to our guests. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arjana, for that very warm welcome. I know we're really excited to be here um, and to hear so much more about um, Ben and Tianyan's um, project, and um, in particular, how um, the two of you have really um, kind of taken um, the extensive Chinese cookbook collection that we have um, in our library, as well as um, materials we have in archives and special collections, um, and use that to, to launch um, a, a unique and um, really dynamic project that I know everyone's really excited to hear more about today. Um, to introduce everyone again, my, uh, my name is Audrey Rusick. I am the food and wine archivist um, in archives and special collections in the UC Davis library. Um, and to give a little bit more introduction to, um, to Ben and Tianyan, um, first, Tianyan um, Hua is a PhD candidate in comparative literature. She's working on her dissertation, Migrating Literature with Labor, Labor, Diaspora, and Modern Chinese Literature from 1900 to 1937, which examines how transnational labor mobility enriches and changes literary writing while the latter facilitates a modernized notion of labor in the early 20th century. Before coming to Davis, she studied economics and modern Chinese literature at Peking University in China. And our other uh, guest today, Ben, um, Ben Rulin Fong is a PhD candidate also in comparative literature in Chinese and English um, with a designated emphasis in critical theory. He received his BA in East Asian Studies in English from Brandeis University and his MST in English Literature from Oxford. He's a Mellon Public Scholars recipient and his research interests broadly focus on Chinese language film, English language film and media studies. His dissertation focuses upon Chinese picture cultures covering a variety of mediums, including illustrated fiction, Xian Huanghua and film. And his transnational research encourages an expansive redefinition and reconsideration of how pictures are adapted, appropriated, and circulated within networks of book publishers, film producers, and audiences. And we're also going to think going to hear a little bit more too about how um, your current work with um, oral histories in San Francisco Chinatown intersects with some of um, your family history. So um, 
with that kind of uh, overview and kind of get and to get us started off today, could you tell us a bit more about your project and how it came to be? Yeah, um, so it started um, kind of in one of our comm professionalization classes in fall quarter 2021. It was led actually by Archana. Um, when I first came to Davis after my first remote classes, I kind of spent a day browsing the special collections for travel writing and collections to centered on food. And it kind of intersected with my master's work where I'd done like a really long year long project on marginalia in travel writing. Um, and I've been taking a class on like consuming empire um, with Fran Dolan. And so food studies was something I was starting to think about. And so when I stumbled across the Chinese cookbook collection, um, because of a piece written by the library, I kind of filed that away as something um, that I wanted to like do on Fridays for the next couple of years, um, if the opportunity arose. And um, we had a day in Archon's class where we were doing public scholarship. And uh, me and Tian Yun had been work working together all quarter. And um, so we called up some items to kind of write the project. Um, and uh, it just seemed natural to collaborate. And we kind of wrote a speculative proposal, kind of outlining a few articles, maybe like a video showing us cooking. Um, and then when um, I applied to like the non-public scholars program, um, that's kind of when the project became very tangible. That's really exciting to hear, particularly from the, you know, the, from the library's viewpoint. Um, you're referring to, as you said, stumbled across the write-up, um, a blog post that we had um, from several years back written by our um, outreach and instruction librarian, Christine Chang, about um, how archives and special collections hold um, really one of the largest, um, the second largest um, English language um, China, collection of Chinese cookbooks in the United States, only second to um, collection at Stony Brook. Um, for our audience who may not know, um, the collection was established in 1991 as the gift of two donors, in particular um, Gardner Pond and Peter Hertzman, both of whom individually um, were avid collectors. They met while they were working together as docents, um, Chinatown in, in San Francisco. Um, and Pond decided to um, donate um, his collection um, in a large part um, because um, of his um, his father's connection to UC Davis as an alum, and also inspired by um, Chef Martin Yan, um, who graduated from Davis in 1977, um, and whose collection um, legacy um, archive we have also just recently received um, as a gift to to the library. Um, and Peter Hertzman also was um, was inspired by Pond's donation. So um, we have over 1,100 cookbooks, um, Chinese cookbooks in the, in the library, just from their gift, um, as well as. Um, it, additional archival materials, menus, um, newspaper clippings, recipes, um, and, and other work. So if you can um, tell us a little bit more, kind of exploring these archives, um, and Tanya, what did you find in the archives um, at the library, and what have you learned from working with this collection? Yeah, thank you for the warm introduction as well as the wonderful question. So just a, a few words before um, I started my slides and added to earlier Ben's introduction how we started. So definitely it was originally a simulation. We are trying to learn what is public scholarship is. And uh, we just try to write, uh, as Ben said, a speculative um, a proposal. But uh, when we really arrived at the archive and spent some time reading those materials, we found that really fascinating. And we really want to make the simulation into, um, you know, actually happening stuff. So that's basically how we started. And uh, uh, so as I mentioned, I do have a uh, slides to give our audience a little bit visual uh, materials to have an impression of what we've found in the um, in the archive and what we've learned from them. Um, yeah, so uh, let me clean my uh, desktop a little bit. Yes, so just like Audrey has mentioned, the overview of the collection, it was donated by Gordon Pond and Peter Hetzman in the year 1991, and it's over 1,000 volumes, made it the second largest North American Chinese cookbook collection, and plus the Martian Yen's recent donation, I guess it will probably become the largest, uh, which is under organizing. And it covered a relatively long time span from the 1920s all the way to the 1990s before the donation. And 
we have uh, two examples here. And on the left, you can see uh, Chinese recipes or in Chinese, which was published exactly one century ago from today. And on its cover, it says uh, one lady who lived in Long Island decided to write a series of letters uh, to her cousin, not only introducing the, some recipes, but also food culture behind it. And in publishing these letters, it aims to show the audience a real picture of packing at that time, uh, the, the city, the China city at that time. And, and when we move to the 1990s uh, example on the right, as we can see, Chinatown uh, has become a destination itself. And we don't really need to run after a real picture of packing, but the Chinatown has become an active member of the uh, rich and active, you know, uh, colorful uh, American culinary culture. And we can stop by having a taste of Chinatown. So the most intuitive question to ask about this collection is that who created these cookbooks? And I have a simple uh, answer. A large proportion of these cookbooks were created by women, female individuals, or women uh, communities. And we have already seen the Chinese, the 2019, uh, 1920. three Chinese recipe compiled by uh, with a Chinese flavor, which was published in the year 1956, compiled by Lin Cuifeng. Uh, sorry, my internet seems to be unstable. Hopefully, you can still hear me. Um, so, compiled by Lin Cuifeng and uh, Lin uh, Xiangju. And uh, so, who are these two? We may not know a lot about them, but we do know a lot about Lin Yutang, a very famous modern Chinese figure who is the inventor of the Chinese character typewriter, as well as a novelist and essayist, as one of the earlier uh, uh, Chinese immigrants to the US who created a lot of work uh, trying to bridge in the culture between China and the US. But very similar, uh, actually his wife and one of his daughters who largely remain anonymous and forgotten in history writing has been doing very similar stuff as him. They are compiling and introducing Chinese cook culture to America, also a kind of cultural bridge between China and America. And here are more examples of uh, cookbooks compiled by women organizations. On the left, we have this tea and chopsticks compiled by a women organization called the Desert Jade Junior Women's Club in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And we, on the right, we have this uh, Cecilia Tooth Chinese Cookbook, a project sponsored by the Women's Charity League in uh, Fatterville, Arkansas. And uh, 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 along with this cookbook, there is also a series of cooking classes of Cecilia too, and this is sponsored by the Multi-Handicapped Children Association. Another Close, uh, uh, closer example is from the, the Cameron Church, San Francisco, which Ben will uh, elaborate more in terms of we did have some uh, oral histories and interviews with those ladies. So they will publish in every a few years uh, a book of co a cookbook and for the community members to fundraise for the church and association activities. So. Back to the earlier question, who and why uh, created these books? Uh, women seems to be a very predictable, but in certain ways surprising answer. So it is predictable uh, because cooking, culinary labor, kitchen work, especially cooking at home, normally have been regarded as women's housework and housework, domestic work is not usually regarded as a form of labor or as significant as waged labor. So it is predictable that a lot of women have those experiences in the domain and therefore they have the capability to create cookbooks like this. However, it is also surprising in terms of this field is largely dominated by females, but the field itself is not fully recognized or not acknowledged as an intellectual field. 
So from my own research experience in the field of modern Chinese literature, I am very used to see male intellectuals' voices dominating the historical narrative. So it really stunned me when I saw so many women, either individual or community-based, actively took charge of compiling, contributing, publishing, dispersing cookbooks like these, and oftentimes fundraising activities. So these are vivid examples of women from the 20s to the 90s uh, actively participated in public domain. So discovering these cookbooks and studying the production of them actually remind us an alternative form of knowledge production. So cooking at home is largely a private, generational laboring experience, but these cookbooks are should be regarded as intellectual endeavors to make private experiences public, especially the communal public that these women are rooted in. And such knowledge production not only provides knowledge of Chinese food culture recipes to follow, but many times the production itself also serves the purpose of charity or community benefits. So another significant or interesting aspect that we've noticed in the archive uh, is the active 1980s San Francisco Chinatown culinary activities or culinary culture. So we see a lot of programs uh, of food culture activities such as cooking classes, tasting banquets, and even food symposiums. So So here is an example from banquet. So they invited the free end uh, menu, as you can see in the menu uh, in the middle, uh, to the participants. Um, and on the right side, you can see there is a series of cooking classes provided to the audience. Uh, this one is to teach uh, people how to make dan dan noodle, a very normal cuisine you can find in today's Chinese restaurant in America. And uh, here is another example of uh, a food symposium. Uh, organized by the California Academy of Science, uh, themed in Chinese culinary traditions. It has a lot of very academic talks, such as Tang China food culture and San Francisco Chinatown immigrants history. And it has, it also has, you know, more public oriented, such as uh, film viewing activities and discussions about most concurrent food technologies. So when we were talking about those culinary uh, activities, there is always a spectrum uh, with one hand uh, authenticity and the other hand fusion and innovation behind existing. And uh, so I have some examples. For example, this is uh, uh, a Jingjiang restaurant's menu, uh, which is a very famous restaurant was invited uh, by uh, by San Francisco to America, and uh, they created this wonderful, authentic menu. And you can you can sense it by seeing the Chinese painting and the calligraph attached to it. A similar example is a menu, a bilingual menu compiled by uh, Marshall Yan for his friends, and we can see uh, the calligraphy is also used here. But we also see that that kind of Chinese authenticity is not something that anyone will follow. So, for example, the Chinese Culture Center, when they organized a series of cooking classes, they emphasized that they are teaching Chinese heritage not as a foreign culture, brought but something brought over by early immigrants and has been inseparably woven into American culture. And the logo of the earlier uh, food symposium I just showed is to, for, uh, to fortune cookies. And the fortune cookie itself is largely an innovation of uh, a Chinese American cuisine, but doesn't really exist in Chinese cuisine. And similarly, we have seen this kind of uh, a menu from the 80s of a San Francisco restaurant and speaking directly to the public fear or public miss of the stigmatized MSG and thank the KOL Uncle Roger, uh, MSG today has largely been demystified. Um, so this is another example uh, by one of the donors, Gardner Pond, uh, who created this very traditionally designed uh, birthday invitation card with the English menu of Chinese cuisine. So 
I feel it is really tricky to discuss cultural essentialism or cultural ownership in terms of this very evolving, updating food culture in Chinatown. So I think the one point that I want to mention is that to understand the food culture in Chinatown is not to see it as a kind of static point in the spectrum be, uh, between the authenticity or the infusion the innovation, but actually it is always fluid and there is very spacious middle ground between the two ends. Um, so in, when we scrutinize the archive materials, we also noticed a lot of uh, you know, news clips about the, the future and the past of the Chinatown. Uh, we've seen that the older generation is disappearing and the Chinatown is calling for urgent uh, improvement or uh, reformation. And uh, the old fish alleyways are disappearing. The groceries, restaurants are also disappearing. And uh, But the community members are also actively engaged in, you know, improving, uh, renovating the alleyways of Chinatown themselves. So we've seen a lot wonderful uh, materials collected by those two active collectors and uh, actually participants of the culinary culture. But we are also curious about those subjects. So how are the people, the communities, the institutions doing right now? And can we uh, step out from the archive from what we've read and find a sort of living histories? Thank you. That's my my introduction to what and then thank you so much that was just incredibly engaging and i know i have many questions um as do i i'm sure our audience at this point i'd love that to actually keep going a little bit more with this um idea you know that you talk about with living history and stepping back um kind of out of the archive um and then into the communities um, you know, the people, the institutions um, that are still, you know, so closely connected to this work. Um, so then could you kind of build on this concept of living history for us a bit? Um, and in particular, um, you know, how you talked about some of the oral histories that you've done. How do you see oral histories as supplementing um, the archive um, at, at UC Davis and in the library? Thank you, Audrey. Um, and thank you, Tanyan, for that. Um, Wonderful presentation. Um, I've had a couple of people say, you know, Tanyan's crushing it. So that's very good. Um, I'm going to um, share my screen. I also have a PowerPoint um, kind of set up. Um, I'll be sharing um, two oral histories today um, that kind of show um, a little bit of what we were kind of working um, with. I need to remember to share my computer sound. Okay. So, um, yeah, to answer your question about oral histories, um, you know, one of the reasons why this kind of initial proposal changed so much is because of, you know, the collection's origins. Um, you know, as Audrey and Tinian have kind of covered, the Trans Cookbook Collection was created by kind of combining the collections of Gardner Pond and Peter Hertzman. Um, and they were kind of members of the Association of Chinese Cooking Teachers alongside Martin Yen. Um, and that's a kind of ongoing. Um, online community on Facebook. Um, one of the leading members of the community um, today is actually a very famous um, Chinatown photographer, Frank Chang, who is a board member of my community partner, the Chinese Historical Society of America, uh, CHSA. He um, leads Chinatown tours. Um, he has an entire collection of Chinatown photographs and he's kind of known as the community photographer. So if you see official you know, pictures from Chinatown, he's probably the one taking them. Um, AC. CT has a lot of materials in the Davis Cookbook Collection alongside kind of the materials that uh, Hertzman and Pond kind of engage with on their um, walking tours. And so it seemed initially to, to be reasonable to kind of begin with that group, um, but that group has kind of expanded from beyond China, San Francisco, Chinatown to the United States. Um, and a lot of the engagement with our archives was kind of changing because of the readings I was doing in um, my Mellon Public Scholars Seminar with um, Stephanie Maroney and having a lot of different conversations with cohort members. Um, Aaron, a cultural studies PhD candidate who works at the Lavender Library in Sacramento and Harleen, who is a PhD candidate in anthropology, who is part of another cultivations project, uh, the Punjabi farmers of the Sacramento Valley. Um, and both of um, those two are leading incredible community led projects, um, check them out. 
and they're both experts in archives. So they gave me a lot of um, th food for thought. Um, one of their shared components of their projects, you know, that I was missing and that I really admired about their thoughtful work um, was how certain histories were made um, by the community using a uh, community's knowledge to benefit others. Um, and Tinian has covered how a lot of the collection can be, you know, a bit um, confusing. And, you know, we covered um, a lot of material and we kind of listened to our mentor, uh, Wendy Ho, who has been, a, who has kind of like a good sense of what to look for. And so um, a lot of these conversations ultimately led us to um, Cecilia II's cooking class, which um, allowed us to kind of think about how to um, form our own kind of sub archive of the archive of materials that we had. Um, so Cecilia II's cooking classes is kind of a cookbook from Arkansas. It really changed the project's direction. Um, even though we haven't really done any work with it, it's kind of what drove our research direction um, after we kind of, you know, discovered it. Um, it was kind of originally produced by Chinese Americans in a rural community in Arkansas. The cookbook was used to raise money um, for children with cerebral palsy. Um, Tu's son had cerebral palsy and the Arkansas Chinese American community had kind of come together to kind of make this um, cookbook that had recipes and knowledge um, that helped someone in the community with an acute need. And so this kind of inspired my own kind of shift in the project, decentering the collection to kind of like make our own sub archive and to kind of expand out um, from, from the archive itself. Um, and I kind of began interested in how we can kind of use the archive and our like funding to kind of provide an opportunity for Chinese American voices to kind of be added to the archive and to share their story rather than kind of view an archive as like fixed um, silent recipes um, rather than stories that could be collected. Um, one of the most rewarding meals we had over the summer was with members of the Presbyterian Church in Chinatown that had produced a number of editions of the cookbook. Um, and it's a bit like Cecilia II's, um, where it's a brilliant example of using community knowledge that is then yet used to help the Chinatown community at large. And I have a clip. Um, I hope the audio is okay, um, and we'll see. Put together by the Women's Fellowship, which is a church women's group for fundraising. And the fundraising, the funds went to Cameron House, which you may have also looked up about that organization because we're connected. It's a mission house, and so we are connected in the work that we do. For the Cantonese group, we thought, well, we'll ask the ladies to give us recipes of the down-home cooking, what they cook at home, their favorite recipes. But it was difficult because they didn't write anything down because they knew how to cook everything the way they cooked, how much to buy and all that. So I think we sort of, I don't know how we managed doing that, but we kind of had to help it along and really talk to them and say, well, let's do this dish and, you know, how much of this spice and this, how many pounds of this meat and that kind of thing. So anyway, it produced this little cookbook and it has names of each one who submitted them. And they're kind of down home cooking recipes, many of them. And then in 60s, so that was 1960s. It was 1967. Um, and Min Tin actually cooked um, some of the recipes. Um, so you get to see that at the end. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll be good. Um, so um, that was like one example of oral histories um, and how they kind of connected to the archive at large, um, kind of the vast majority. Um, even though like that was a really good example of an oral history collected um, from the archive itself, um, the vast majority of our oral histories over the summer are kind of from our work with the Chinese Historical Society of America. Um, CHSA is a physically located organization in Chinatown that's kind of part of the broader um, Chinatown San Francisco community. Um, it provided kind of the best, the best mix of expertise and resources. And we had like an incredible project lead, Kimberly, who has kind of pivoted um, since then to pursue further Chinatown community-centered work. Um, it was really exciting for us to be working with Kimberly. Um, we're all kind of in a similar place in our lives and careers where we're both kind of thinking about how histories and connections with Chinatown can shape, you know, the, the, the project as a whole. It was really inspiring to chat with someone um, who is also a younger Chinese American um, in kind of an older Chinatown today. And we're kind of figuring out how we can best contribute um, to future Chinatown and chats with Kimberly um, over food kind of shaped how the project um, went and kind of what it is today. 
our conversations focused on navigating digital and physical resources experience with, you know, collecting oral histories and it had an incredible network that she introduced me to that kind of facilitated connections with our interviews. Um, but how did we go from like archives to oral histories? You know, a lot of the intellectual work um, will be covered in the first episode of our Cultivations podcast, so stay, stay tuned. But our oral history period uh, pivot was informed by critical archival studies. Um, while I was originally focused on improving the accessibility of the collection by producing like a physical bilingual cookbook and online bilingual website, um, it, that was kind of foundationally about the Chinese cookbook collection. And we kind of wanted to explore ways to, you know, maybe um, to, to spotlight, you know, historically marginalized peoples and stories. And as we've seen, you know, archives can consist primarily of cookbooks and menus, which are quite silent. And, you know, sometimes they only scratch the surface of the historical and cultural breadth um, that food and foodways kind of allow and encourage. So, you know, our oral history and community built archives are a great solution to kind of address um, these, you know, differences in the, you know, traditional archival practices. We tried our best to kind of ensure that community members were at the center of our archives. Um, Michelle Caswell, she's got a really great um, piece called Seeing Yourself in History. And um, it kind of focuses on how archival um, intervention um, kind of should partially be through independent nonprofit organizations that can uncover um, little known stories um, like the ones that we've found and it kind of identifies, you know, like at risk priorities. And what I mean by ask at risk priorities are, you know, instances um, like our um, Chinatown um, bookstores, for instance. Um, there used to be um, three when I started the project and now there's actually only two. Um, uh, Louis Bookstore is the one on the, the far right, and that's the one that um, closed while I was doing the project. Uh, and um, I would have loved to have um, these interviews, but perhaps reflecting who goes into bookstores in Chinatown, um, they were all in uh, Chinese, so I wanted to um, not have to do some some subtitle work for everyone. Um, and, you know, these are like at risk interviews, right, where um, they're older interviewers who are, you know, kind of in an at risk um, kind of um, uh, Kind of a, a job right and so what we're able to do is then collect kind of their stories um before it's too late um and a lot of that is like following footnotes in the archives for instance east wind bookstore um it's the one on the left um we only found it because it was um had a sticker um on a couple of the books that we were reading and so we kind of like oh this where, where did this cookbook come from and we kind of followed it from there um, so that's a really good example of using footnotes in archives um to kind of ideally encourage um, community members to kind of create new records to document kind of experiences and to fill gaps in, you know, historical records for which, you know, pre-existing documentation like really doesn't exist. Um, and, you know, ultimately oral histories are kind of like a means of, you know, self-representation, identity, construction, and empowerment. Um, at their best, it's kind of what our archives do, right? Is it kind of empowers people um, to see themselves in a new light across space and time. Um, this is all from uh, Michelle. This is not, I'm not, I'm not poetic enough to write this, but um, at the very best archives then catalyze this new self-reflection into action, motivating users into activism beyond their personal context um, to form a living archive. Um, and so finally, um, you know, the diversity in our oral history is kind of reflected a tangible problem about how to like present our research. Um, while well, I had been initially keen to kind of use a website or a narrative style story, um, these narrative forms, you know, are can be quite constricting. And so what we decided was to kind of follow um, the archive itself. Um, they, we had some really beautiful um, maps. And so what we decided to do was kind of drop pins on a kind of digital map um, to share kind of like um, a, a history. Um, so, you know, these are two really good examples of, of really um, great maps in the archive that we were able to like kind of follow up on. And we ended up, you know, at least reaching out to everyone on these. Um, maps and so um the walk shop is a very um kind of famous um store um it's uh, it was a really rewarding interview um and let's uh listen to to tan for like what your like grandparents thought about like um chinatown or like coming here for visits oh my goodness well being from albuquerque new mexico uh of course uh they were not they didn't have the you know the um uh, exposure to the culture at all mm -hmm. And so uh, when I wanted to come out here, it was a, to them a very big city. Yeah. And uh, the, they were not sure that I could probably uh, 
make make it here on my own because of finances they weren't going to finance my college education yeah. and I told I was determined and I told my parents that not to worry I'll get a job and I'll go to school and my mother was worried that I might get a job and not go to school yeah so uh, I said no I will keep my promise I'll do both I, I'll, I'll I, I had my I'm very persevering yeah. and uh, I said I can do it you know maybe it'll take me longer to go through school yeah. and but I'll support myself and uh, as hesitant as they were they let me come out here yeah. and that was the best move I ever made and I really like this interview because um, you know Tain uh, she's, she's well practiced in her storytelling and she um, you know kind of shows that you know Chinatown isn't like this like static place where um, you know you immigrate you immigrate and then you kind of stay in Chinatown you can do that but you know Chinatown's um, kind of built from a whole bunch of different people and you know you can come from New Mexico uh, to Chinatown and become like a really big part of the um, community um, and so this is kind of where our project is kind of engaging with we've got like a digital map with a whole bunch of pins that kind of describe um, uh, where we visited and like the interviews that we did. So um, Tane's um, kind of interview is in this like workshop section on the um, bottom um, image. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Oh, oh and uh, these are some of the cooked recipes we did. The two of them are from Gourmet Delights. Um, and uh, these are from 1967. Um, and uh, this is kind of what we made. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much. And um, we're looking forward to continuing the conversation. And thank you. That was just absolutely wonderful too. And kind of the, the compliment um, to what you've shared along with um, Tianyun's presentation. In particular, I think that this idea as, as you kind of almost like literally walked us through of kind of starting starting in the in the archives with the what the library holds and then following kind of following the different trails um sometimes actually you know again literally mapped out um other ones are you know kind of following again I love the idea of saying okay these books seem to have been purchased at this bookshop you know let's let's go discover um and one thing I think to, to kind of get us started um that you've had me think about is for instance I don't know if all of um, if everyone who's in the webinar today, you know, realizes that um, well, certainly some materials um, at the UC Davis Library and, and archives and special collections are available digitally. Many are most are still, you know, you need to come into the reading room to look at them, um, which and they don't circulate, meaning they don't leave the library, but that we are a place that is open to the public. Um, and so anyone from really experienced researchers to people just starting out are welcome, um, you know, to make an appointment and come in. So I'm, I'm curious for the two of you, um, as you started kind of, you know, exploring more of this archival work. Did, has this project helped you discover something about archives that you didn't know before that maybe you're not more you know, passionate or excited about or just kind of surprised you? Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit and then switch to Ben. So uh, in our conversation with uh, the Cameron Church ladies, I really find it fascinating because before we've seen those cookbooks, but they are just lying there, right? But when we got the chance to really talk to people face to face, and we got to know that there's this little women association, uh, when the members were well, very young, it was organized, but uh, now it has reached their eight, uh, 60s or 70s, but they are still having frequent meetings each week. So that really fascinated us like by the, the stories behind the production of the cookbooks. Yeah, and for me, I think, um, you know, I've done quite a bit of, you know, archival work in the past, but it's all been quite, um, you know, confined to special collections, which is very fun in its own um, way. And I, I really enjoy working in special collections, but this was kind of the first time where I was like, oh, I can kind of go out um, and kind of, you know, um, Kind of see where the archive leads us and kind of extend that um archive and so that was like a really um just like paradigm changing experience where it's like oh wait you know it kind of breaks the the, the curtain or the veil where it's like oh i can actually go um and kind of make my own archive and so it was a really kind of exciting experience to kind of work with chsa to do that sounds like it um and I, you know, I certainly have have a bunch of questions of my own too that I can keep asking, but I would love to um, also open it up to um, to our audience. So I'm, I'll move back and forth. Um, but please, um, for anyone who is with us today, if you have any questions, to please put them into um, into the Q and A, um, and we can ask them of um, 
of our panelists. So actually, we have, we have one here. Um, and the question is, how did your interviewees react to your work? Did they share any thoughts about the younger generation's relationship to Chinatown and its history? Yeah, I think um, that's a really good question. And I think um, what's interesting is when we ask that initially, sometimes people would be a bit apprehensive because I think that there's kind of like this expectation that there's like a certain answer, like, oh, Chinatown is changing and that's like negative or something. Um, and like, um, you know, I think everyone very quickly um, was like, you know, that's definitely not the case. Um, you know, and I think uh, everyone in Chinatown is very excited by like where kind of Chinatown is like moving and growing, um, you know, because I think there is kind of like this, um, a lot of like different different fears that are moving around a lot about like, um, about, um, you know, like rising rent and such. Um, but everyone that we talked to is just very um, keen to, like, you know, have more younger people kind of involved in Chinatown to be part of Chinatown and everyone kind of welcomed everyone with um, open arms. So it seemed to, um, you know, feel free to come down and I'm sure, you know, you'll be welcome. Yeah, when uh, I have something to add, but when we were doing some street interview, like basically we are wandering the, uh, in the Chinatown allies and the, like stopped uh, pedestrians and ask them silly questions. And I noticed that definitely the residents in Chinatown have sensed the kind of changing generations through the lens of language, not exactly the food, but some will say that the earlier immigrants speaks Tai Shan Hua, the Tai Shan, Tai Shan, uh, uh, accents uh, Cantonese. And then it comes to more, you know, formal standards Cantonese. And now more and more Mandarin speakers are coming. And definitely that is a kind of generational shift that we noticed in our interviews with Chinatown residents. Thank you. Um, it's, kind of, it's interesting to, to hear, you know, the difference also between maybe people's, you know, or even your own expectations um, and, um, and then, you know, the experiences that you had. We have another question um, and um, from an audience member who is interested in whether or not you noticed at all how uh, quote unquote chopstick fonts um, kind of it says came and went on the covers of some of the books that you looked at. So you showed some covers of books, including Chinese recipes from 1923 that used a kind of non stylized font. But later, the cover of the edition of Cecilia II's book does use this kind of um, chopstick font, which perhaps also, if, if this is something that you're familiar, if you've looked at, um, you could describe a bit more. Um, have you seen any trends um, that have to do with the kind of the difference in, in fonts on the covers of these books? Um, I can answer this question. That's a fabulous question. That's actually, I didn't realize a font issue until last night that I was watching a video um, from the YouTube talking about the very font of chop suey or the chopstick font you mentioned and how it was, you know, uh, created by non-Chinese people and uh, to have a kind of direct association with the Chinese ethnic and uh, how it was widely adapted in, for example, restaurants, logos and some of those uh, Chinese cookbooks you've seen in my slides. Um, I have to admit that we didn't really notice that when we were uh, scrutinizing the, the cookbooks from the archive, but definitely um, the knowledge of its usage and its involvement uh, in its usage definitely can be an interesting to you know, trace afterwards. We can bring these fresh, fresh eyes to relook at those cookbooks. And also, I think uh, one information that I got from yesterday's video is that the usage of these font is quite, you know, uh, becoming less and less compared to historically. Uh, like a lot of high-end Chinese cuisine restaurants were used very delicately designed the font and to try to avoid this kind of, you know, um, redu reductively uh, ethic associated fonts. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for that explanation. Um, another question we have. Um, first, um, the audience member is thanking you for this incredible work. I concur. Um, and the question is, how do you see oral histories as a way not just to expand archives, but as a way to enact specific kinds of localized understanding of those materials? through such accumulation and negotiations of community and personal history. I can reread that if, if, if you don't have it in front of you. Uh, 
Yeah, thanks, um, Manas. I think that that's um, a really, you know, important question um, to ask. And I think uh, a lot of it kind of relates to, you know, like our own kind of connections to um, San Francisco Chinatown. Like for instance, my um, family kind of immigrated to San Francisco initially, um, and then they kind of sprinkled out after that. But, you know, San Francisco was always kind of like the, the center point. And so a lot of um, the engagement with oral histories kind of began, um, you know, with with my family. Um, the first oral history I did um, to test out all my all my equipment was with my uh, mom and dad. So, you know, I think um, a lot of um, your, your oral histories kind of begin with, you know, the the community, the the self, and then it kind of expands um, outwards. Thanks, Ben. We have um, another um, attendee who, again, thanks you for sharing um, these fascinating stories. You know, it's, it is interesting to see how cookbooks and oral histories complemented our understanding of Chinatown history. Um, this person's wondering, were there people from other ethnic backgrounds who also contributed to the making of the cookbooks? Since we know that San Francisco's Chinatown is such a multi-ethnic community. Did you find any evidence of this in your archival research? Yes, definitely. So uh, what I showed is the earliest one is a 1923 from a Chinese lady, but actually there are earlier ones, especially from the tens, and most of the authors of those cookbooks are, you know, uh, Western uh, travelers after they traveled to China and other Asian areas, they come back and write a kind of travel log and also uh, provide a certain um, Asian cuisine recipes. So um, definitely there are a lot of examples of multiple have you like narrow it down and the folks more on the cookbooks that were produced by you know either uh chinese immigrants or um uh or the the descendants of, of the chinese immigrants or you know originally lived in chinese people uh, in china china's lands people yeah thank you for the question thank you Tianyan. Um, so along, you know, kind of moving between the cookbooks um, as well as in the oral histories, um, I have another person, I think this is a fantastic question that I, I imagine also too many people um, might have um, if they're inspired, like I have been from um, the directions your projects have taken or your project has taken. Do you have any tips on recording oral histories and the interview process for a project like this? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, I think um, you know, the two clips I played were actually on edited um, examples. So this is a very good example of um, kind of the mistakes I was making. Um, you always want to uh, make sure that you're not interrupting um, when you're a lot of those. I think both of those interviews are actually the first time I met. Um, I always like to interview people twice. Um, and the first time I meet someone, there's kind of like this negotiation of, you know, kind of affirming what someone's saying. So having these like, yeah, or like, uh-huh, um, which, which is, is terrible things for the audio. And you have to go in and like edit it out. Um, but um, yeah, I think, I think that that first time you, you kind of want to be building a relationship. So you want to be, you know, kind of ruining your audio quality a bit um, for that, that second interview as well. Um, and, you know, I think one of the important things to do when interviewing is to kind of like ask people to describe things or um, kind of ask, um, kind of kind of let them kind of linger on um, a memory. So I think one of the like, you know, either like what does a place, you know, smell like or what does a place or what does a food taste like? A lot of that can kind of let people kind of stay in the memory and kind of uh, re-remember things, because um, unless they've practiced it a lot, like Tane has, um, they're kind of re-remembering it um, with you. And I think that's a, a wonderful point, Dan, and feel free to, to add in too. Um, but I think I think also, especially um, as you're mentioning, that there's so much actually that is said or that you can understand in many, in pauses and the kind of silences and, and, and pacing um, in, in oral history. So thank you for, for bringing that up as well. Another question, um, again, which is, I think, fantastic for anybody, um, too, who might be interested in, in visiting the library and, and, um, and exploring, especially, you know, as this collection has, has recently grown by over 30,000 more volumes now with Chef Yan's um, donation, what is a good way to absorb the cookbook collection without reading randomly? And separately from that, 
what stories from the cookbooks stood out from a cultural standpoint? So maybe if you could address the first part of that question, what's a good way to absorb the cookbook collection without reading randomly? And then um, also perhaps share each of you maybe a story um, that stood out um, from you know one or more of the cookbooks from a cultural standpoint. Um, yeah, so I can start. I always think that the box the box of the archive can be very interesting. It has a lot of personal stuff. And I found all those programs for the, for example, culinary classes, as well as tasting banquets from that. And uh, I think that's quite different from, you know, formally published cookbooks. And it can give you a taste of um, decades ago what the world would be. And it actually has a lot of, you know, um, shopping categories included, and we can see the, the customer price in the 80s. Uh, so yes, so if you want to uh, not a kind of randomly reading those cookbooks, the box can be a good choice. And the what stories? Um, um, I, I, uh, I cannot think immediately because there are so many, but uh, uh, I think I enjoyed reading uh, the cookbooks, for example, the, the paratax, uh, the preface to it, uh, the acknowledgement to it, and uh, like uh, the dedication, or who is it dedication, dedicated to. And uh, well, uh, speaking of a story, maybe I can provide the story of me following the earlier recipe as shown by uh, Ben. And uh, I think that recipe is shrimp, sweet peas and eggs. And I think the sweet peas is not uh, that often you the ingredients Chinese cook ingredients in the US and you know to fuse the the the, uh, the cooking ways method from the Chinese cooking and I think this you know even embedded in one single recipe we can see a kind of fusion of uh, cooking culture yeah yeah and for me um I uh, I like within the second or thir third um, kind of time that we we were, me and Tanya were in the archives, um, I did like a keyword search of like maps because I just like really wanted to look at how Chinatown had changed over time. Um, Cause you know, it is just like a, a fascinating story. And that's that part of what the, the digital map is trying to do is it's trying to, you know, if there's even like digital markers and pins of, of places on streets like don't even exist anymore. And so part of it is just kind of like this reconstruction of like, um chinatown while kind of still maintaining like where it is today um so yeah we really enjoyed working um with the maps and um yeah i think in terms of like absorbing um i think it's really good to kind of um yeah as just Tinian said you just you kind of want to find a, a big box of materials and then you can kind of like discover um because those are like the moments where you're going to have like a lot of um kind of fun and discovery and if you don't mind me taking a moment to describe for people who might not understand the difference between the two. So on the one hand, we have, uh, you know, these thousands of cookbooks. Um, and while many, you still do need to um, request them because we can't take them out of the library. You have to look at them um, in the reading room, um, which is a, a space in the first floor of, of the Shields Library. But we also have what are considered archival, you know, manuscript uh, materials. Um, so these might be menus or letters or some of the um, kind of the maps that are part of different the kinds of uh, ephemera and paper materials that um, have been donated and we keep them um, in, um, in in boxes that are kind of organized in boxes and I think that those that's what you're referring to I think when you're saying that um, kind of exploring and they can provide a um, kind of a starting point. Some of the materials in there can provide a starting point. Um, so I would like to offer myself out. Um, if, if feel free to please anybody contact me if you're interested um, in kind of you know having an entry point into um, the, the food archives in this work. But um, I love that idea that you've shared of um, rather than trying to start big, finding um, finding one you know one thing to to hook onto um, to then lead um, to lead from there. Okay, we have so many questions I, um, that are really, um, let me uh, we'll work through these. Um, the next one um, is um, from an audience member who notes that the community activism aspect of this communal cookbooks is really interesting. Um, 
Sherry says she grew up reading her mom's cookbooks, many of which were of this kind, the cookbook of the Junior League of Pasadena or Kentucky Kitchens, a women's club cookbook from Lexington. Um, she's not aware, was not aware that these cookbooks being were motivated by concerns from within the group that produced them, as was the one that Tianyan that you mentioned that was motivated by fundraising um, for the, a child's illness, right? That there was a kind of reason for the production behind these. Um, so this could be um, an interesting point of comparison for you to pursue further. So based on this, have you found that, um, were there other cookbooks um, of these community cookbooks where the sort of the purpose for their creation was to benefit a another cause? Um, thank you, Sherry, for, for bringing that up. That's definitely fascinating. That, and it can even you know, enable us to think of the 60s and 70s women's activities within uh, having those kind of culinary uh, cookbook production as an important field. And uh, uh, one thing that I want to emphasize is that we also do not want to make it a kind of limited to women and in terms of gender, the labor that women are supposed to, to do that. But I think for one, we need to acknowledge that. And then for two, uh, we need to uh, encourage that different uh, job can be done, done by either whatever the gender uh, identification is. And definitely, I think this is a very potential field that we can do some comparison with other cultures, cookbook productions. Um, yeah, Ben, do you want to add anything? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot of um, my like general scholarship is partially on like categories and like how people kind of structure like and organize their information, especially when it becomes too large. And so I think it's interesting how um, despite all these cookbooks having different um, kind of intentions or reasons to be produced they're all kind of organized in very similar ways of like you know this is an appetizer this is a main course this is a dessert and then it's kind of working through um like locally like presumably ingredients that one can um, acquire and so i think that that's interesting we we're able to kind of compare um you know chinatown um, cookbooks and say like okay so these are the ingredients that are being used with um you know somewhere in i think you mentioned kentucky where it's like maybe there's a different ingredients being used there and so i think that that's that would be an interesting point of comparison um to explore further yeah and speaking to early audrey's point about the the cost of the uh i think uh I didn't expect so, but it turned out that many the many of the productions of the cookbooks are like community oriented and they are serving certain fundraising or like fundraising for a child's illness. And I think that's really fascinating that uh, you are doing this not as like singly broadcasting the food culture, but also you are doing some community service that's like beyond our expectation and we are happy to learn that. Absolutely. Kind of, again, that's another layer to, to consider in terms of um, the creation of these and who might be then um, purchasing them and, and using them or, or purchasing them for, you know, to support a cause. And, and um, so, um, no, I think that, thank you for, for all of those, those insights. Um, along those lines, as you're kind of mentioning the, the, uh, the one in Kentucky, um, another um, um, attendee is asking, um, are you interested in exploring other collections in smaller communities in Northern California, such as in Marysville or Dutch Flat? There may be some old cookbooks in the small museums or historical rooms in these communities. That's definitely a good reminder. Yes, we, we, we will, will not be able to know their existence if not someone brings them to us. And thank you for, and I will definitely write those uh, locations name down. Sounds great. Um, you know, I think, you know, incredibly rich. I mean, I guess you talk about kind of archives and in expanding archives and where they're located. Um, it can be kind of, you know, unexpected and surprising places um, that have actually quite extensive um, community holdings. And, and I will say that there are like other scholars working in this um, field as well. So, I, you know, I, th I can see a couple um, scholars in attendance who I know are working on um, like Northern California. Um, 
China, Chinatown uh, or, or Chinese American food. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to just be us who are like um, doing uh, food cultures. Uh, I know there's a lot of really diligent and hardworking scholars who are kind of working on this um, as well. Um, a question from another attendee um, that I imagine might be on the minds of, of, of many guests here today. Have um, Do you have plans to interview Martin Yan, um, who has donated his um, his legacy archive, food archive to UC Davis Library? Yeah, you know, uh, we'd love to. Um, and, uh, you know, we're we'll, we're kind of working um, to, to hopefully um, do that. So, yeah, we would love to. And, uh, yeah, stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and now it becomes an open call. Actually, we have compiled a, a whole page of questions that we want to interview Martin Yan, but it is his decision to accept our invitation or not. I think we are all eagerly anticipating this. So um, I, like the rest of everyone else, you know, um, will will cross my fingers and hope that that um, that comes to fruition. And I will certainly tune in um, to listen to that conversation as well. Um, we have another, um, just as a note, it's a, a comment, but I um, can share with everyone um, for folks who might be interested in more um, reading, particularly along the lines of thinking about um, cookbooks and um, and women and women's role in writing cookbooks, um, that there are um, two scholars um, whose books, um, Janet Theofano's book, um, Eat My Words, Reading Women's Lives Through the Cookbooks They Wrote, um, includes a discussion of why many of these cookbooks were written by women, um, as well as another um, book, Recipes for Reading, Community Cookbooks, Stories and Histories. So um, there's some additional um, re relevant reading material, um, whether it's um, new to you both or, or anyone in our, in our audience today. Thank you, Andrew, for the recommendation. Another question um, that we have from a guest, what kinds of foods or techniques do you suspect may not, may not be represented in cookbooks? Either because people didn't write them down or they didn't describe them in detail um, because, you know, writing, um, you know, they were writing in some ways with a lot of implicit knowledge. So whether in homes or in restaurants. So there are layers to this, this question. Um, I'll repeat it again, but I think it's interesting. What kinds of foods or techniques do you dis do you suspect may not be represented in cookbooks because people didn't write them down or didn't describe them in detail because they were writing with implicit knowledge? Um, and I'm going to follow this up a little bit with just an, an anecdote from teaching that you may have discovered when cooking from some of these original cookbooks is, for instance, early cookbooks, um, say from the early 20th century, do not always tell you what temperature your oven is supposed to be at, <laughs> right? There might just be an understanding that you that you know. Um, so um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for, for that question, were there any kinds of foods or techniques that weren't actually represented? Yeah, I think um, a lot of like the implicit understanding for a lot of these um a lot of the cooking is you're like, you need to have a wok. It's supposed to be on like high heat. And um, in a lot of American homes, it's going to set off a fire alarm um, unless you like, you know, do something about that. So a lot of the kind of implicit knowledge there is, um, you know, you're supposed to be using a specific cooking tool and it's supposed to be at a very, you know, specifically high temperature. Um, and uh, who is it? Um, Kenji Alt Lopez on YouTube. He, he um, kind of rearranged, um, he's, he's a new YouTuber and he kind of rearranged his um, kitchen to like, you know, he like removed his um, like burner and then he like has like a really big jet and then he just kind of like lets it kind of go. And so that, that's kind of like the um, implicit knowledge that is not necessarily stated um, in the cookbooks result. You kind of have to like mess around with like your entire kitchen to kind of kind of be cooking like the, the right way. Yeah, I have something to add on that. Actually, I think this is a very intriguing question in terms of uh, the, the the current knowledge system of Chinese cuisine has a little bit been, you know, ethnocentric in certain terms, and it mainly focused on the, the main areas of China and uh, it um, inevitably, you know, um, leaves out a lot of minorities cooking experiences. And I do think that this kind of minority cooking uh, culinary cultures uh, also exist in, in the, the America, but they are not, you know, that formally um, recorded or formally introduced to the public. And I think this is a good, very, a very good reminder that we need also bring that mind in mind that what is left out of the collection. Yes, thank you very much. 
Thank you both for um, those points and examples. Um, Another guest, Jenny, writes, thank you for this great talk. Um, we know that many Chinese were cooks for Anglo-Americans. Are these European recipes, so are what you're finding European recipe, recipes, um, or have Chinese immigrants um, influenced, um, and I guess in the second part of this question, um, has, have Chinese immigrants influenced any typical US recipes? So perhaps um, if I maybe understand this question too, um, that, in addition to having sort of Chinese recipes that were, you know, that you might be finding for um, low audiences in these books, conversely, um, do you see Chinese influence, Chinese cooking influence in more kind of traditional or typical U.S. recipes because of that role of Chinese cooks? Um, that's a very good question. And I find it, it's, hard because I'm not an expert in American cuisine. And I think the very term American cuisine is a very, you know, multi uh, cultural and uh, high, highly hybrid uh, quest, uh, you know, term. But I do watch a lot of cooking videos from um, Golden Ramsey <laughs> and uh, she will, uh, he will practice, you know, multi multiple cultural cooking experience. And uh, I think, uh, a, a very um, expert, experienced chef as he is, he definitely is able to, you know, fuse a little bit or borrow or, you know, uh, learn from the other cultural cooking techniques. Yes, that might not directly speak to the question, but that's my answer <laughs> that I can think of. Thank you, Tianyan. No, I think, you know, it, what, these questions are sparking such interesting ideas for, um, you know, for projects that that take um, can take you in, in a lot of new directions um, and really expansive, but also would um, kind of enhance um, some really interesting um, understanding of and analysis of, of um, these of these historic materials. Along those lines of kind of expanding um, and thinking about, you know, additional directions, um, another attendee is wondering um, whether or not you have any interest in moving beyond San Francisco's Chinatown to other Chinatown sites, um, especially because they are not always ones that are in big cities in California. There can be ones in rural, the rural Chinatowns, such as the one in Hanford in Central California, um, which was also the site of one of the most famous Chinese restaurants um, until it closed um, in the state until it closed in the early 2000s. Um, so, as you've been thinking, you know, if you think um, more broadly about this project, have you considered moving um, beyond San Francisco to other Chinatown sites? Yes, I'm also very curious about those Chinatown's histories because like my dissertation deals a little bit with the exclusion act and I've heard, read a lot about the earlier um, immigrants Chinatown's histories. And I think definitely more Chinatown's can have more, you know, um, real histories behind them. Yeah. and. Um... You know, I think that um, there's a lot of ongoing scholarship um, about like New York City. Um, I know that Seattle has also been like a, a focus as well. Um, so I know that there's like other scholars kind of working within their communities um, to kind of like um, do that sort of work. And I think unless I were to kind of um, be living there for an extended period of time, um, I don't really want to um, like uh, kind of kind of overextend myself, I guess. Um, I very much want to kind of um, kind of work in conversation with the scholars in Seattle or New York City. Um, I don't want to kind of fly over and um, kind of be doing a lot of their work. That I'm sure. Thank you. We um, another um, question that we have. Um, again, thank you for the absolutely wonderful presentation. As you continue to engage with all of these wonderful materials that are in archives and special collections, so this is kind of extending on the previous question, um, can you talk about where you see your research going from here? Yeah, um, so we definitely need uh, want to like finish up um, the digital map. There's like a whole bunch of stuff um, that we still have to do um, regarding that. And we um, need to clean up the oral history audio um, and kind of do um, second or third interviews um, for the people that we have interviewed. 
Um, and yeah, I think that this, this is a project that could, we could be doing um, for as long as that we're at UC Davis. Um, and even if we were to you know, stay in, in California, we could be doing this um, probably for our entire lives. So um, it's definitely something that um, we want to like kind of continue um, just kind of collecting um, and kind of interviewing um, with CHSA and um, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of see <laughs> how far we can take it. Yeah, a closer result can be an exhibit co uh, collaborated with a, a library. So we are planning to maybe do some, select some items and do some small exhibitions in the library, maybe next quarter. Yeah, we're, we're excited for for um, for that exhibit and also for everyone to know that even if I'm um, hoping that everyone is able to come over to the library when that exhibit is in place, um, but also that we do have um, digital versions of the exhibits um, that we launch and, and remain um, on our library's website, um, you know, in perpetuity. So for, um, you know, even after the, the physical exhibit is um, is closed. Um, a few more um, guests have recommended um, some um, some texts that you may or may not be familiar with um, that in American Chinese restaurants but published by Rutledge in 2020, there is an interview with Chef Martin Yan and Chef Ming Tsai. Um, and then also another reference might be Keila Tompkins's um, Racial Indigestion, Readings of Material Culture, Novels and Cookbooks in the 19th Century. Um, Jennifer um, wonders whether or not you have a reference list of the Chinese cookbooks and culinary material you've been using at UC Davis that you can share. We have an excellent long running uh, Google sheet that we've been using with a whole bunch of just random thoughts on it. Um, for, for anyone who wants to like explore um, the, the Chinese cookbook collection themselves, um, I highly recommend. Um, it, it's a little bit, um, tricky, but basically you go to the UC Davis, you know, library search engine, um, you kind of choose a drop down menu that says like special collections, and then you can type in like Peter Hertzman or Gardner Pond, and then you can kind of get the whole list of um, all the items. And so that's like kind of the best way to kind of explore um, the entire collection. And I will actually kind of add on to that we in fact have on on um, through our archives uh, through the UC Davis library um, in page we had in archives and special collections, we actually have a landing page specifically um, for the Chinese cookbook collection that describes it. And at the bottom of that page, um, there are hot links. So for um, both Gardner Pond and Peter Hertzman's names, that if you click there, it will set up then exactly what you've described about how to it kind of takes you right to um, the, the library catalog and to search within um, the catalog for books that are part of that collection. So thank you. Another question here um, is like, what, re which, re excuse me, which regional cuisines, Southern, Eastern, or Western Chinese, et cetera, are most and least represented in the cookbooks? Um, I feel like this question is really hard to answer. I think a lot of, for example, we've seen uh, in my uh, slides, the Sichuan cuisine, uh, a special event. And we definitely see a lot of Southern dishes because a lot of early immigrants are from that places. But it's also hard to decide sometimes which cuisine it originally belonged to because it has already fusioned and adapted to the local ingredients that they are accessible to. Um, so, um, I have a sense that maybe Southern and, uh, you know, the Sichuan cuisine, uh, uh, are like, uh, more represented, but I'm not so sure of my answer. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's really interesting, um, hearing Tinian's answer, cause we haven't talked about this. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I think my kind of intuition would be to say a lot of it's, you know, Southern cuisine, cause that's where kind of like the original, like a, a lot of the first immigrants, um, came from like around like the, the Guangzhou, uh, Guangdong province. And, um, but then if you go to like the more recent, like 1970s, 1980s cookbooks, a lot of that is from Taiwan and, um, you know, depends on where, um, you know, th those came from. And a lot of that is because, you know, Taiwan is like a, a bilingual publishing center. So a lot of the cookbooks that we found from the eighties are from Taiwan. And a lot of it is kind of like, um, a, a bilingual kind of spread. So it very much depends. Thank you for that. I think we're um, we're getting close to wrapping up here. So um, I'm going to take our last question from um, the audience for now, um, which um, again, so many, really excited. Thank you both so much for your great work. 
Um, there are um, two, actually, there are two questions here. I'm going to ask the first here. And there may be other cooking techniques and recipes that are passed down orally within the family or through more, more hands-on means. In your interviews, have you encountered any of these non-textual, non-text-based recipes? Um, I personally did not. Um, I, I, I kind of, I think that's a question that I should probably be asked. I, I will ask that um, in future um, interviews. I think um, a lot of my questions are kind of focused on like favorite food. So I think like just the, 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 the technique itself is um, something that's quite interesting that I have not kind of um, encountered. Yeah, I think a lot of our, our own experiences of learning how to cook is through the kind of or orally generational um, transformations. And uh, I myself learned how to cook by, you know, watching my grandpa and it is men who are cooking in my house. <laughs> so grandpa will cook and I will like provide some assistance and that's how I learned to cook myself. Um, yes, I, and I think definitely that's a good reminder, reminder as Ben said that we can keep asking this question in our following interviews. Thank you. Um, I'd like to kind of close with, with one other one that um, you've talked about, but I'd um, like you to address a little bit more directly. And this has to do with, with your process. I mean, one of the things together is that, um, you know, you've done so much community-based research um, and, and work, as well as um, cross-campus collaboration, um, which, you know, is, is perfectly representing um, the goal of um, of this partnership and work today. Um, and yet I would also say, you know, the two of you have been working together on this project and you, you talked a bit about its origins, but what has it, you know, for anybody out there who might be used to doing particularly archival work independently, um, what has it been like working together and why did you choose to work collaboratively rather than individually? You wanna start? Sure, I will start. Um, yeah, I think um, I, uh, I, I reached out to Tanyan just because uh, like I, I uh, enjoy working with Tanyan and um, it just seemed like a really um, logical kind of kind of fit. Um, I think um, like more academically, um, I um, knew that you know Tanyan has like a whole different kind of knowledge uh, like a set of knowledge than I do and I thought that we would complement each other really well. So I think you know finding your weak points and then instead of like, um, thinking, oh, I'm going to do all this myself. I think, you know, just kind of finding someone who can compliment you is like a really good um, strategy. Yes, definitely. I enjoy co-working. You know, a lot of times, you know, at the humanities uh, research are down alone. And I found this kind of co-writing and, uh, you know, go to the archive together, do interview together can be a lot of fun. And also definitely you will need some help uh, when you are doing some more practical stuff like interviewing people. Uh, you know, it's not only that we can combine our wisdom together, provide different perspectives, and we also need, and I think that's a, the crucial point of any kind of cooperation is to tolerate. <laughs> it's, it's not saying that we are having you know difference, uh, but you know, for example, when you are co-writing something, you have to uh, let down your ego and uh, allow your sentence to be modified by your partner. And that's how we did the co-writing. I really enjoyed like mutual modifying each other's writing. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. So thank you so much. What a wonderful note on which to conclude this uh, really fascinating uh, webinar. You know, thank you so much to Ben and to you and Audrey for making the time and sharing your research with us. I find it uh, astonishing that this isn't the PhD dissertation, but this is being done in addition uh, to the dissertation project. Uh, really speaks to both uh, the passion that you have for this project and the value and importance of uh, personal as well as academic, um, as well as just uh, how uh, some, you know, a, a detour can uh, sometimes uh, just take over one's life. I know it's happened many times uh, to me as well. It's one of, I think, the great things about being in an archive 
were uh, taking a, a wrong turn sometimes um, and can end up being so uh, rewarding. Uh, thank you for all for, for, for joining us and uh, congratulations on launching such an exciting project. Um, we want to just remind our uh, participants that this has been recorded and we'll be editing it and we'll, it will be available on the DHI's website and on our social media channels. Uh, we hope that you will use this, um, listen to it, uh, circulate it, but also we're hoping that uh, these webinars uh, will become resources that people can use in their, uh, for their own research or for their uh, classes or for their teaching. And it can also serve as an inspiration going forward for people who maybe want to uh, uh, you know, look up special collections. Um, I want to just uh, tell you, please do sign up for the DHI Digest, uh, which goes out weekly on Monday evenings, where you can uh, get information about our events, but also the uh, follow up to the series. That's going to be a series of podcasts as well as the upcoming exhibition. So you can keep up with the uh, ever new research uh, findings that Ben and Tibun are, are, are coming up with. Uh, our cultivation programming will continue into the spring quarter. We've got a full slate of very exciting events, including a week long um, uh, a week long series of focusing on the contributions of Punjabi farmers to the Sacramento Valley. This is once again a partnership uh, with the Middle East South Asia Department as well as the UC Davis Library because we have a pioneering uh, digital uh, a Punjabi digital archive at the library. So it's going to be a really fantastic event uh, on that front as well. So uh, without further ado, keep uh, do keep in touch with the DHI. Congratulations once again to Ben and to Yoon. Thank you all for joining us today and to Audrey as well and to the library uh, for uh, partnering with us on this wonderful event. Uh, thank you all very much. Stay safe, stay warm, and we'll see you back soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.